Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Avinash Paliwal, and I am the Deputy Director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. And on behalf of SOAS and on behalf of the Institute, please allow me to uh, welcome you for this very promising uh, conversation around a very important book that has recently been authored by Dr. Ian Sanjay Patel, who's with us today. Uh, the title of the book, as you can see, as you know, is We Are Here Because You Were There. Uh, and it is on immigration and the end of empire, uh, a topic which is not just of relevance to, to you know, with, the, with this focus on Caribbean and the subcontinent. It's not just of relevance to people, you know, of a particular time or interested in a particular kind of history, colonial history, but it is very much a live issue. A live issue simply because the issues regarding citizenship, regarding migration are quite quite potent as we have seen in the past couple of years, quite central to what Britain is and is perhaps likely to become in the years to come as we try to figure out where the position of the country will be, whether it be Brexit, whether it be Europe and other issues. So this, in my view, as someone who focuses disciplinarily on international relations is a central issue for today and the way ahead. Uh, so from that perspective, it's a very welcome intervention based on, from what I can gather, a lot of hard, uh, you know, you know, very a lot of archival resources in in Britain and elsewhere. Uh, and just to introduce you, uh, introduce Ian to you, he is currently a LSE fellow in human rights, uh, and his nonfiction writing has appeared in a variety of of outlets, including. The New, New Statesman, the London Review of Books. He was born in London and he completed his PhD at Queen's College, University of Cambridge. Uh, welcome, Ian. Thank you for joining us. And to discuss this book about immigration and the relationship between the Commonwealth and the United Kingdom, as of you know, historically and also today, uh, you know, I would like to welcome Dr. Taylor Sherman, who is the deputy head of the department and an associate professor. Uh, of international history at the London School of Economics as well. Her research concerns the cultural and political history of India in transition from colonial rule to independence. So I cannot, force, I cannot see anyone more suitable to really engage with the debates uh, that have been made, uh, or the, you know, with the debates and the arguments made in this book. So a warm welcome to you, Taylor, as well. I won't talk for too long. Just wanted to introduce yourself. I'm, very much, I've enjoyed reading sections of the book. Uh, I must admit, I haven't read it from cover to cover, but I do look forward to doing so. But I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. And on that note, Ian, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much, Avinash, uh, <clears throat> for, the, for the introduction and also for the invitation to speak today. And thank you very much, Taylor, for agreeing to discuss the book with me. Uh, I'm really delighted to talk about the book, uh, which, as Avinash mentioned, is called We're Here Because You Were There, Immigration and the End of Empire, uh, which was published by Verso a couple of, couple of months ago now. Um, and the, the aim of the book is really to provide something of a global history of migration and the end of the British Empire, and in particular, post-war migration, to Britain between 1945 and 1973. And of course, 1973 is the year when Britain finally joins Europe. And there is, I think, a, a rather intuitively obvious link between post-war migration to Britain and the end of the British Empire. But I think there were certain complexities within this link that to my mind, when I set out to write the book, remained unclear. And in particular, uh, I was aware that this story of post-war migration tends to be told as a domestic affair, rather than a much bigger story implicated within the international politics and diplomacy of decolonization. And when thinking about post-war migrants to Britain, I was particularly interested in those who came in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And surprisingly little had been written about this period in the existing literature. And in the late 1960s, it was South Asian British citizens resident in East Africa that in particular were bothering British officials 
uh, facing majoritarian policies in Kenya designed to squeeze Kenyan non-citizens, these Kenyan South Asians were making good on their British citizenship and leaving or attempting to leave for the UK. And the book is perhaps the first full length study of migration out of East Africa of Kenyan South Asians in 1967, 1968, as well as the migration of Ugandan South Asians in 1972, following the expulsion order of Idi Amin. And in telling these episodes, we're immediately directed to uh, another story. Um, because the migration of South Asians to East Africa in the first instance redirects, redirects us to questions of in, intra-imperial migration, including the emigration of white Britons in the so-called British world. And it turns out uh, that these episodes in Kenya and Uganda in the late 1960s, early 1970s, are also very revealing ones for post-war British policy. When the Kenyan South Asians attempted to migrate to Britain, Britain passed the Commonwealth Immigrants Act in 1968. And this was unique among the post-war immigration laws in that it was directed against all British citizens per se, and remarkably blocked these citizens from entry and residence in their own legal homeland on the basis that because they'd never lived in Britain, their nationality and their citizenship was more of a consular status rather than a fully fledged citizenship, including normal citizenship rights, not least the right of entry. And the Commonwealth Immigrants Act in 1968 left these Kenyan, South Asian, British citizens stateless in reality, although they still remain described British citizens in law. So this was a very strange uh, piece of legislation and it set up particular questions in my mind regarding the rights of a national with respect to the state to which they belong and states unreconstructed sovereign power at the level of membership and borders. And of course, the late 1960s is also the time when the first major treaties of international human rights law are coming into effect. And eventually in 1973, the European Court of Human Rights found that the effects of the 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act on certain individuals among Kenyan South Asians were racially discriminatory. Those were the words that were used and a form of degrading treatment, no less. Now, the human rights issues attendant on the 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act are well known, but what had not been written, written about were the uh, diplomatic attempts by British officials to foist Kenyan South Asians onto Indira Gandhi's government for permanent settlement in India. Uh, so before they passed this piece of legislation that they knew was going to have various uh, implications at the level of human rights, they tried to settle this question diplomatically. And Britain, in a particular period between 1967 and 1973, tried to, and they sometimes succeeded here and they sometimes failed, tried to exploit India's complicated relationship after 19 after 1947 with so-called overseas Indians, despite the fact that the overseas Indians in question were often full British citizens. So in a briefly, that's the story of Kenyan South Asians in 1968. And I began to see this story as something of a lost, a lost episode in our understanding of global 1968. The East, the East African South Asians who carried British nationality were seemingly on a fault line between colonial and post-colonial worlds. And according to competing official discourses about them, they belonged neither to post-colonial 
Kenya, nor to post-colonial India, nor to Britain. And Britain seemingly was here seized by a kind of post-war nativism that was very much a departure from the imperial idealism of preceding decades. And looking back on the episode as a whole, I soon realized that the, the year seemed too late because after all, the age of decolonization is entering its late phases in 1968. And of course, British direct imperial rule had all but ended by then. So why were there still colonial British citizens in East Africa at that time? So taking a step back, the, stories, the story of the book is not only about the circumstances of, of these migrants, uh, South Asian British citizens in East Africa, but also looking at those migrants in order to explore a wider series of paradoxes about post-war Britain and post-war Britain's place in the international order after 1945. So as I already alluded to, the post-war migrants to Britain were described as immigrants in the 1960s as if they were outside British nationality. This was both in political discourse and in the titles given to immigration laws. But this was misleading. It was misleading for British officials to call these migrants immigrants since they were in fact mostly British citizens or Commonwealth citizens, which was an, another status within British nationality law. So they were not aliens, in fact. So this was a strange uh, slippage or fudge that British politicians were able to take advantage of. And the reason they were able to do this was because of a wider paradox or tension. And this is the central paradox or tension that British nationality and citizenship remained imperial throughout the age of decolonization and all the way to 1981. It was only remarkably in 1981 that Britain created something recognizable as a national citizenship around the territories of the British Isles. Prior to this, between 1948 and 1981, British nationality was primarily defined by a single non-national citizenship around the territories of the British Isles, but also around the territories of the Crown Colonies, creating colonial citizens who for various reasons ended up keeping their status even after various colonies such as India and Kenya gained independence. So in principle, if not in practice, all colonial citizens carried full rights of entry and residence in Britain as set out in the 1948 British Nationality Act all the way to 1981. They weren't able to access these rights because of immigration laws. So before addressing this question of how and why British nationality and citizenship remained imperial throughout the age of decolonization, we can acknowledge that there's something of a strange reality here in the sense that British immigration laws in the 1960s and early 1970s were targeting citizenship rights provided in British nationality law. So bizarrely, it's the post-war immigration laws, not British nationality law itself, that's dictating who belongs and who doesn't belong in Britain. So in other words, until 1981, post-war immigration laws sought to constrain the provisions of British nationality law itself. So there's something of an internal contradiction here. So then let's move to this question of, of why successive post-war British governments refused to dismantle the imperial structures of British nationality, in, particularly in the 1960s when formal empire is ending, and instead chose to pass immigration laws as so many bandages on nativist wounds as the imperial heartland became home to more and more non-white migrants. So in order to answer this in the book, I explore the relationship between Britain's post-war imperial citizenship and its status as a Commonwealth centric power rather than a nation state, at least in the first post-war decades.
So let's take a, another step back. Post-war migrants were arriving in Britain in the 1950s because of the generous citizenship rights granted under the terms of British imperial citizenship, which British officials termed Commonwealth citizenship. So in other words, the purpose of creating a post-war British imperial citizenship in 1948 was to give constitutional life to the post-war Commonwealth. And this, I argue, is part of a post-war idealism that saw the Commonwealth of Nations as the latest iteration of British imperial idealism. So what I'm getting at here is that various British officials were not prepared to dismantle imperial citizenship in the 1960s because this would be to give up on Commonwealth idealism. The Commonwealth being the vehicle through which Britain tried to contend in the making of the post-war world. The Commonwealth was presented as multiracial and thus an answer to the United Nations. And it was also presented as a grand constitutional and political receptacle of so-called Anglo-centricity in world politics. And this was the last vestige of pre previous imperial dreams of a British-led world government. So my conclusion in the book is that Britain, for a short period, appeared to want to have it both ways. It wanted a commonwealth based on perceived Anglo-centricity abroad, including imperial citizenship, and yet at the same time, it wanted exclusivist immigration laws at home. So what do we learn about post-war Britain here? Well, Britain's self-image in the 1960s is at the very least confused, if not self-deceived in particular ways. And what, what was Britain after 1945? Was it a nation state with an imperial constitution and imperial citizenship? Was it at the helm of an imperial British Commonwealth? Or was it more modestly part of a multilateral Commonwealth of Nations alongside other freely associated states? Now there was a good deal of confusion and uh, changeability here. And Britain tended at various times to present itself as an embattled small island, yet with a crucial world role. It was also had a relationship to uh, human rights and the rule of law, and yet it was forced to deploy sovereign power in the face of immigration crises and other forms of crisis. So there was a, something of a confusion here. And by the late 1960s, Britain's reputational power particularly the United Nations, was closer to bankruptcy than apogee. So returning to post-war migration and immigration laws, Britain passed clearly what were exclusivist and racially discriminatory immigration laws, particularly in 1968 and 1971. And this represented nothing less than a tiering of British nationality along racial lines, a form of indirect racial discrimination. As, as set out by the European Court of Human Rights in 1973. And as Britain did this, there were a range of international figures concerned with international racial equality who criticized British immigration policies and argued that British decolonization contained unreconstructed efforts to rejuvenate British imperialism. So post-colonial leaders, including Indira Gandhi, Julius Nyerere, Hastings Banda and Eric Williams, as well as a slew of post-colonial diplomats, writers and intellectuals, criticized British immigration policies and cast doubt on the future of the Commonwealth. And Britain was of course being criticized also at the UN General Assembly and in various Commonwealth fora. And yet Britain in the late 1960s still refused to uh, dismantle these structures of imperial citizenship or allow the entry of non-white British citizens who were resident overseas, like the Kenyan South Asians. Instead, British officials beginning in 1967 conducted a global census of non-white British citizens resident outside Britain 
worrying about uh, attempts by these people to migrate to Britain, and also worrying that when they finally did try to dismantle the 1948 Act, this would not only have consequences for Commonwealth idealism, but it would also probably inspire a so-called beat the ban rush, <clears throat> which meant that Britain, ten British officials were prepared to sort of kick this question into the long grass as the 1960s and early 1970s wore on. And I would go so far as to say that by the end of the 1960s, there was something of an, a, an associative realm within the minds of various British officials in, in which non-white migrants conjured and embodied the stymied imperial ambitions of the Commonwealth and Britain's embattled place within the international public sphere. So you're left with uh, a situation where if Britain couldn't make good on its supposed claim on post-war world politics, all that was left to it was its sovereign power at the level of citizenship, borders, belonging, and migration. So by the end of the book, I aim to have retold uh, as a whole the story of post-war migration, not simply as a domestic affair and a reaction to non-white migrants now in Britain itself, but also as a rather fitful adaptation of Britain after 1945 to shifting international realities, norms, and values that were far beyond its control. There was a, a rather cultivated uh, self-image among British political elites and officials that was being damaged by international criticism uh, of various kinds. And the immigration story and the migration story has an important place within this. So at the end of the book, we're left with the sense that actually, in a way that we hadn't realized before, the international politics of decolonization was very relevant to Britain's self-image and also to the trajectory of post-war migration and to the reputational cost Britain suffered at the hands of, at the hands of its exclusivist immigration policies. So I, 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 my aim and my hope is that by the end of the book, one sees clearly these remarkable correlations between the story of post-war migration and the wider story of a rather long and fitful end to the empire. And overhanging the entire story is Britain's relationship, the question of Britain's relationship with India after 1947. This, there, there are two aspects to India's importance to these stories. One is India's centrality to the Commonwealth going back many decades. And, uh, and, and also after 1945, and also the preponderance of South Asians among non-white British nationals resident overseas. And, and British officials, as I write about, were not, were not beneath trying to uh, draw on diplomatic relationships in order to outsource and supposedly solve the question of post-war migration and, and keep particularly South Asian British citizens resident overseas out of Britain. So I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ian, for such uh, such a scent, but also such a detailed kind of uh, exposition of your book and its key arguments. Um, Taylor, the floor is all yours. Great, thanks, um, Avinash, and thank you, Ian, for this invitation. I spent the last um, 12 hours or so, not in a row, but 12 hours or so reading this book and very much enjoyed it. Ian and I met a couple of, maybe three years ago at the LSE, and we had this coffee where we both realized we were working on Indians overseas. And I think we were both like, oh no, are you are you saying what I'm saying? Am I saying what you're saying? And and we, we it turns out we were making similar arguments, but about the very different communities. Um, and so it's nice to see your work come to fruition um, and to be part of this event. Um, and also a huge relief that you aren't saying exactly what I was saying. Um, so I, I wanted to make a couple of comments about the book and then I have, I think, three questions for you. 
So as I, I saw this as a kind of book launch event, so I, I really have a lot of praise for the book. So anybody who's on the fence about whether or not to buy it, this, these comments are for you. And uh, first of all, I was just impressed uh, at the erudition uh, in evidence in this book. So I, I spotted allusions to Vladimir Nabokov, to J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, to Kazuo Ishiguro, and I enjoyed all those literary references. And it just shows that actually you're not just a historian slash sociologist, but a, 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 a writer, uh, which made the book very enjoyable to read. There are some beautiful turns of phrases, some uh, lovely vignettes and colorful portraits of characters, not just important politicians, but also um, ordinary migrants. And I think that's a real, uh, you know, it's hard when you're looking at policy to actually draw out colorful um, portraits of people is, is hard and that's a real um, plus of the book. The second thing that I was really struck by, especially as a uh, for for an early career researcher, is this huge breadth of the story that you're telling and all the different sets of scholarship that you're drawing together, right? So British domestic politics, decolonization, immigration, but not just immigration, immigration of South Asians, immigration of people from the Caribbean. And that was um, very, and the fate of minority communities across the former British empire, uh, everywhere from Trinidad to Kuala Lumpur. And the, just the breadth of it is, is worth picking up because um, you tell that story very well. Um, uh, I was also impressed by the, this is the third aspect that I think is worth, makes the book worth buying. I was impressed by the myth busting aspect of the book. In fact, I, I thought that the Windrush generation had been invited to Britain to fill post-war labor shortages. And um, that myth was busted for me. And, and really, I, th I found it very interesting that it was a complete surprise that the Windrush generation arrived. Um, and that instead, the British had spent time trying to recruit Europeans, white migrants from Europe to fill their labor shortages. So yes, there were labor shortages after the Second World War. Uh, and yes, uh, people arrived from the Caribbean, but that doesn't mean that they arrived to, at the invitation of British politicians. So that was a real myth busted for me. And I also thought one of the very important arguments here is that the British did not, although we think of this period from 1945 to 1981 as the period of decolonization, they did not see it as such. And they did not accept the decolonization as what they were doing for a very, very long time. In fact, mostly they were reimagining and reconfiguring British power in the world rather than accepting this retreat. Um, and that, I think that's quite an important argument because it leads to the two, two other, I think, important arguments in the book. The first is that um, immigration control was always racialized. We're not new racists in Britain, we're old racists in Britain in a sense, in that in that sense. Um, and the immigrant the debates around immigration have always been racialized uh, and and heavily in infected with, with racism, frankly, from, from the very beginning. And that is a legacy of empire, not just a practical legacy, but also an intellectual one. If it's it is not too grand to say racism is an intellectual um, endeavor. Uh, and and so, for example, I am an immigrant, but I never uh, claim that publicly because my experience is not the same as non-white immigrants. Uh, and it, it's precisely because of the racialization of this legislation that I am not seen as an immigrant in this country and I can't claim the same uh, experience. I don't claim the same experience as, as immigrants from the Caribbean or South Asia. And that, that heavily racialized immigration control is, is central um, to your arguments. And I think very important to bring that out. Uh, and then finally, I think what you show us is um, kind of an old story. So in another guise, I, I do a master's on the comparative history of empires. And at, what we see is that um, every empire is building on a previous empire. So nothing is really new. And empires don't end. I think is what you're arguing, they become something else. And the British Empire hasn't ended, it's become something else. They, uh, British politicians tried to make it into the Commonwealth um, and to, to reconfigure British power in the world. Um, but the, in so doing, and uh, you show that they really failed to fully grasp the nature of empire. 
they didn't really understand it, even as they were reconfiguring it. And in particular, they didn't have a full understanding of the repercussions of empire for the colonized. That as late as 1967, they were trying to figure out which colonized subjects had traveled where in their former empire and to whom they might have some responsibility is incredible. I mean, it's in one way not surprising because yes, maybe they weren't, they didn't have all that control that they sometimes uh, assumed that they had, but also incredible that they just didn't fully grasp uh, the repercussions for empire for the colonized. And that's a failure that of course we live with today in Britain. So I think those are the important arguments and that's my pitch for why people listening might want to read it or buy the book. So I have some questions for you. Um, I thought that this was an important reframing of empire, of, of decolonization as really empire becoming something else rather than ending. But in some ways, it's also the story of one piece of legislation, this 1948 British Nationality Act, which with a big boom, granted citizenship, Commonwealth citizenship to everyone in the empire, including um, pe people who were in recently colonized states like India and Pakistan, whose citizenship of the empire only ended when their own citizenship regimes came into place. Um, and it's a remarkable piece of as you claim, and I, I agree with you, of, of liberal imperialism, of liberal imperialist legislation. And I wanted to know where it comes from. You hinted uh, in the book that uh, it was drawing in part on the fact that Canada, I think, was about to issue its own legislation. But I'm thinking, is I'm wondering, is it part of a larger reimagination of the British Empire that was taking place? during the Second World War. So during the Second World War, they rethink empire uh, as um, something where they have responsibility to develop the colonies. They're reimagining it as they, as they think about how they're going to um, pay off their war debts and, and rebuild after, uh, um, after the war. And so is, what, do you have any hints about the larger um, historical thinking that went into this extraordinary piece of imperial legislation. Does it is it part of that reimagination that comes in the Second World War with the Second World War, or does it really kind of come out of the blue in 1948 and you know it just kind of mistakenly become law without too much thought? So that's my first question. I have two more, but I'll let you answer that. Thank you so much, Taylor, for those comments and you know your kind words about the book. I I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I, I, I do agree, you know, that, that the, a lot of this story does come down to one piece of legislation, a remarkable piece of legislation. Um, and it's interesting because it, uh, quite late in the book, in 19, and we're already in 1967, uh, uh, an official in the Commonwealth Office says, uh, you know, why did we pass this act? And having passed, I think the way he phrases it is having passed it, we now have to pay for it. Um, and there's a sort of reckoning with, uh, you know, that, what, that piece of legislation and, and the fact that in the late 1960s, it was, it hadn't been dismantled. Um, and, and immediately, uh, I mean, one thing to, no to, to note straight away is I think there was, there appears to have been uh, very little understanding, perhaps close to nil, that the, the piece of legislation in question in 1948 would lead to uh, such a large migration uh, of, uh, of people to Britain, uh, specifically, specifically non-white migrants. Um, that was not foreseen by Clement Attlee's government. Um, so I think that's that's quite important to realize. I tend to see it more as, as you said, uh, an act of uh, liberal imperialism and also something of a constitutional device that Britain had long been engaged in. Uh, so if we go back before 1948, the, the, the other really key piece of legislation on British nationality occurs in 1914. And this is really an attempt to, for the first time, codify British subjecthood and clarify the relationship 
between Britain and the so-called white dominions, uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. Um, and the idea here is to promote imperial unity in the face of the expressions of nationness and sovereignty by the white dominions and retain um, a, a kind of imperial coherence. Now, what, what's interesting is that in 1948, uh, Clement, you know, the, the lawmakers within Clement Attlee's government decide to recodify British subjecthood, uh, but they call it something else. They call it citizenship of the United Kingdom and colonies. But essentially, it's they're retaining the scheme of British subjecthood, and the British subjecthood actually remains on the books. Uh, this is part of the sort of oddities and complexities of British nationality law. British subjecthood remains on the books until 1981. So you have many centuries of a kind of unbroken expression of British subjecthood, and that always had a kind of um, imperial currency uh, to it. And, and clearly Britain was thinking about what the Commonwealth would be in after 1945 and having a strong and generous unilateral recodification of British subjecthood, uh, now called citizenship of the UK and colonies, was a powerful message, even though uh, that Britain had no way of making sure that the new uh, citizenship laws in places like Canada uh, and other places and would, would actually reciprocate the, these generous terms of a Commonwealth citizenship, so-called. Um, and then, so, so that's the story of, you know, why the act was passed. And there's a lot more to this. There's also uh, Indian diplomats who were pushing heavily for uh, a common Commonwealth citizenship and, and urging the whole of the Commonwealth towards free movement. And it was only really Britain that really decided to uh, make good on this demand and create a, a unilateral non-national citizenship. But then there's this other bigger question of, you know, why in the 1960s did they not sort of dismantle it in the first instance um, and instead pass these immigration laws? And the first one is not in 1968, it's in 1962. And, it, and actually, it's, it doesn't affect British nationality because it's an immigration law but it does end the centuries long right in principle of a British subject to travel to the Imperial heartland. But they were careful not to dismantle the 1948 act. And, and there's, there's two ways of looking at this. I think you could either argue, as I've mentioned, that there, this Commonwealth idealism, there was a, an unwillingness to finally let it go, even though Britain, realize the economic gains of integration within the European economic community. There was, a, there was a tension there and that Commonwealth idealism needed to be preserved in the form of the 1948 Act. And then there's also this much more practical fear that when you finally do dismantle the 1948 Act, you have to reckon with all the dis, uh, dispersed British protected persons and British citizens uh, carrying these colonial citizens, this colonial nationality, who may try to, as it in the in the parlance of the time, beat the ban, and Britain just sought to defer and defer this final uh, reckoning. And even in the late 1970s, there's some new work coming out by Philip Murphy on this. That even in the late 1970s, Britain was still sort of worrying about finally pulling the plug on the 1948 Act and, and, what, and what that was going to trigger. Uh, and this is still, you know, this is still going on with the recent legislation vis-a-vis -vis Hong Kongers carrying British nationality. So as you, as you sort of said, there's this sort of huge um, story about um, uh, the effects of imperial citizenship and Britain was unable to control it finally.
Thanks. So um, my second question is really um, about how, I mean, it ties to what you said about India and its influence on the 1948 Act, because I know the Indians were very keen to protect overseas Indians via a, a Commonwealth citizenship. And Raphael Khan, uh, a collaborator of mine, has written about that elsewhere. And so it's quite interesting to see how much influence India had over British legislation at this point. Um, uh, and so I, I saw in the book that India protested um, against um, the 1960s, the legislation in the 1960s, calling it discriminatory, um, and that the British, as they prepared this legislation, they were worried about Indian protesting, so Indian protests. Um, so all that makes sense to me. But what I was surprised by and found very interesting is about the 1950s that they got that when the British, they passed this 1948 British Nationality Act, people started migrating to Britain. It was a surprise. They wanted to stop them. So they got rather than pass new legislation, they tried to get Commonwealth countries to agree to help them stop migration in other ways. Uh, and so India and Pakistan agreed to, to help Britain reduce migration from South Asia by, by not issuing passports to their own people if they wanted to go to Britain. Uh, and I was surprised that India and Pakistan uh, agreed to play along with this game. What surprised me even more was that Caribbean governments refused to play to 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 help Britain limit migration from the Caribbean to Britain in the 1950s when those Caribbean governments were not yet independent. So we have British people in the Caribbean refusing to help British people back at home uh, limit migration. And so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about those negotiations, if you know anything more about them between parts of the British Empire in the 1950s to to try to restrict my, the migration of Caribbean people back to Britain. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as you, as you sort of said, this is this is also um, needs to be seen in terms of transnational history. And, and that's why it's particularly good to speak to you about it, because your new work, together with Raffaella Khan, is sort of shedding new light on, 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 in, on the way that India perceived this with respect to um, Overseas Indians, and and Rafael Khan, as you said, has a uh, has has new work coming out on this idea of a Commonwealth citizenship, as India saw it. So it's important to recognise this is a a transnational history, even though that my book is is much more with sort of within the British perspective, and 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 yes, you know, it's 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 interesting that Britain, in the first instance, uh approach the problem of post-war migration as something that could be outsourced to uh, either colonial or commonwealth governments. And uh, there's actually work, new work coming out by Kalitamika Natarajan, which talks about this long relationship that Britain and India had at the level of controlling um, Indian migration uh, Altogether, and and particularly to to Britain, um, but it but it's interesting. I suppose there's 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 two different stories here, which which I sort of tried to uh, bring attention to is is that it, the story of post war migration is not simply these laws, these immigration laws. There's also this in this uh, vast diplomatic uh, set of stories in which these problems uh, are Britain is attempting to, to resolve privately um, and drawing on these sort of long-standing uh, assumptions of um, cooperation. And uh, Britain at various points was, was quite confident about this and, and at every step of the way, the it, uh, British officials tried to resolve these questions diplomatically uh, because they they obviously it was it was only it was always a last resort passing legislation because they were always uh, fearful of the implications of legislation um, not simply you know and this included the the reactions of governments uh, like Canada and Australia to something like the 1962 Commonwealth Immigrants Act um, 
And when they couldn't solve these problems diplomatically, then they would pass uh, legislation. But, it, but as you said, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Caribbean uh, governments in the 1950s, they were not able to, uh, to, to British officials' dismay, they were not able to stop uh, migrants coming from places like, in particular, Jamaica. And I think the British cabinet uh, had around a dozen meetings during the 1950s saying, we are gonna have to do something eventually about this question, but we don't want to do it. And if we do do it, we risk sort of being more like the white dominions who've always been, who've always been discriminatory at the level of immigration. And we want to retain our sort of imperial idealism on these questions if possible. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and the, the will to retain this idealism. My very last question is picking up on something you said in your summary. You said Britain wanted to have it both ways. They wanted to uh, reconfigure the empire as the Commonwealth and center its power in the world in the Commonwealth. And they also wanted to have an ex to retain or create an exclusive understanding of Britishness at home. Um, and I, I, you know, I see resonances that in that, of course, in the Brexit debates, and you might call it cakeism or Johnsonism. I mean, I don't want to give him as much importance as to to give him an ism. Uh, but I, I wondered if um, I wanted to ask you about whether there were any subtle differences in this having it both ways, cakeism kind of ideology with respect to power and identity. Were, are there any differences? Were there any differences between Labour and Conservative governments? I could discern none in your book. It seems like there's this amazing continuity between them. Uh, and I wondered if uh, you m might have uh, more to say about whether Labour or the Conservatives had variations of this cakeism ideology. Thank you, Taylor. Uh, yeah, you know, that, that is a, a very good question. And, and I was also struck by the level of continuity between successive post-war governments, you know, as you move, as you move from the Conservative government in the 1950s, early 1960s, into Harold Wilson's Labour government, and then eventually into Edward Heath's uh, Conservative government, there was a remarkable level of continuity, you know, originally Labour sort of set itself up against the Commonwealth Immigrants Act 1962, and then it and then it sort of uh, changed its policy and decided that th th this question of immigration had formed into something akin to a bipartisan consensus. Um, you know, what what is interesting? There's, I think there's various ways of uh, of looking at this. Um, there's also, I mean, something we haven't mentioned is the creation of the British uh, Indian Ocean Territory in 1965, and, and that's a, something that, you know, sort of, again, the, the, that story begins with Harold Wilson's Labour government and then, and then goes, and then Edward Heath's Conservative government is very integral to that story also, and what happens to the inhabitants of the Chagos, Archip uh, Chagos Archipelago. Um, I mean, I think at the level of human rights, uh, attention, there's a particular level of attention we need to give to the 1968 Commonwealth Immigrants Act, um, which occurred under a Labour government. Um, you know, Edward Heath's Conservative government is traditionally given a lot of credit for accepting uh, Ugandan South Asians after the expulsion in 1972. But as, as I write about, that story is a lot more complicated uh, than it's been tends to be presented, and and I think that continuity is is quite remarkable that the, there was such a consensus uh, between Labour and Conservative governments, and it's and it's very hard to sort of uh, to sort of say that one is doing more or less than the other. So there's some uh, further questions there, I think. Yeah, thank you. That's that's it for me, Avinash. I'm happy to hand back to you. Thank, thank you so much, Taylor. So much, Taylor Renian, for that really fascinating conversation. I, mean, I, I I have a lot of questions coming up myself, but you know more about the fact that look, I'm a citizen of India, living in the UK, and I have all sorts of voting rights in the United Kingdom. 
So I actually don't have an incentive to give up my Indian citizenship because uh, I don't feel the need to do so. You know, this way I can get the best of both worlds. And it makes me wonder that perhaps in the post-war context, there was this liberal idealism, right? Um, British imperial idealism, in, as you mentioned, or, you know, even empire becoming something else uh, and, and citizenship being a very kind of potent sort of a platform of what it becomes. Uh, and it makes me wonder where has empire come today? Because both the conversation about empire and the Commonwealth has kind of really resurfaced in some fundamental ways. And what is it that let UK keep uh, or continue allowing citizens from Europe and not the European Union, for example, to actually vote in its national life uh, and it's even daily council life, to be honest. Uh, uh, what purpose does it serve, serve today? But again, this is a bit off topic in the sense that it's more contemporary than, than historical, but it made me wonder what the afterlives and what the transitions are and what does it really mean, if anything at all, today. But I'll keep that, you can take that question at your convenience. It's not, you know, I just wanted to kind of put it out there. Uh, to all the audiences, thank you for listening so patiently till now. Could I request you to either raise your hand or put your question in the Q&A box so that I can read it out uh, if required, but you're more than welcome to come and introduce yourself. But please do introduce yourself either way, whether you're writing the question in the Q&A box or kind of asking directly. So I'm looking forward to hands coming up hopefully soon, but we do have one question by, uh, sorry, I raised my hand just to show that I'm okay with being raised. So uh, the first question by, is by someone anonymous, an anonymous attendee, and uh, Taylor and Ian, I mean, again, it's, you know, I would like to continue this as a conversation format. So Taylor, please do come in with your thoughts too. Uh, the question is, it's a bit off topic, but do you see some similarities to what happened there, that is in the United Kingdom in the 1960s, and what is sought to be done now in India, uh, albeit with a religion-based assessment with the passing of the Citizenship Amendments Act, two years ago that in, intends to put restrictions on citizenship, citizenship entitlements uh, of immigrants from erstwhile, quote unquote, erstwhile India. Perhaps you could, would you be able to speak to that, Taylor? I think you may be better placed than me. Gosh, uh, I'm not really well versed, um, but I, I see, I, I see, yeah, I, I think I, I would rather uh, comment on something that I know uh, much more about. I, I, I can see why the question was asked and I can see parallels, but I'm, I'm not sure I can answer in any coherent way apart from to say, yes, I, I see why you're asking. Sorry, not, not my field. I'm a historian. I mean, sim in, in, a, in a similar way to Taylor, I'm, I'm not sure I can shed too much light on this uh, either. But, you know, one thing, one thing I would say is that... Um, you know, it, India in 1950 did have a, 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 a more expansive um, definition of, of citizenship, particularly with respect to overseas India. And then in the 1955 Act, there are certain constraints. And, and what's interesting is that um, as, far as, I, as far as I know about this question, um, that these adjustments to legislation are all going back to a piece of legislation in 1955. And in that sense, you, could, you, you might be able to sort of compare that to these adjustments to legislation in, in, in Britain uh, and the sort of centrality of uh, citizenship laws up, upon state succession and how important these questions are. And, the, and you know, the implications for minority groups. Ian, thank you for that. There is a question from our Facebook Live um, chat from Johan Chackel, who is a PhD candidate and a good friend here at SOAS. Uh, and Johan's question is, how much of the journey from the Citizenship Act of 1948 to the Commonwealth immigration restrictions of 1968 would you attribute to the decline of the round table movement and its power? Again, it's a question both of you could kind of, you know, share your thoughts on. I mean, that's a, that's a very interesting question in the sense that, 
what the question may be getting at, getting at is the sort of the, the intellectual origins of Commonwealth idealism. Uh, and one of the things that I wanted to allude to in the book um, is the fact that the Commonwealth itself tends to be seen in Britain, in the British public sphere, media, and among politicians as, as a sort of, you know, not very significant constitutional uh, edifice um, and, a, and a sort of set of constitutional devices rather than something that was really integral to uh, British identity, Britain's role in the world, self-image, etc. And the, the intellectual origins of this are very much go, going back to the round table movement, these sort of dreams of um, imperial federation, even a British world state and uh, uh, Vinit Tokor, among others, have, have written uh, very important books uh, on this question and the kind of um, the Commonwealth idealism that was that was coming out of it, which reached the sort of apogee uh, uh, before uh, the Second World War, and then very abruptly sort of came to an end. Uh, and and what's interesting, and and what I wasn't able to do in the book is is really um, sort of trace those the the um, the vestiges of uh, that that particular form of. Uh, Commonwealth idealism after 1945, and I imagine there's a lot more to be to be written on it. But what I would say is that there's a kind of there's a memory of those intellectual origins and what the Commonwealth could be. And, and the point here is that the British Empire evolves, that it has new iterations, and that it tends to be quite sort of self-effacing. Um, and, that, and in that sense, the Commonwealth um, is the highest stage of empire, not its end. Thank you so much, Ian. Taylor, I was wondering if you, do you have any, would you like to add something? No, okay. Any more questions? Questions and comments are highly welcome. Yeah, while, while the audiences kind of, you know, think a little bit more and join us with some more thoughts uh, in the coming minutes. I have, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, if I may go back, take you back to, uh, perhaps I'll try to ask a more historical question rather than a contemporary one. And it's really kind of exploratory rather than based on any, you know, foregrounded on any knowledge on my part, at least. Would you, I mean, when, I, when you think of the United Kingdom, its relationship with, you know, this, the contract with the citizens, its kind of economic visions, its strategic vision, its relationship with Europe during the Thatcherite years, uh, we see a very, in kind of a very potent departure in some ways if continuity is other. Was there anything peculiar about the issue related to citizenship in that period, which got kind of dislocated from, you know, the larger sort of, uh, the liberal idealism that we that you kind of elucidate on uh, in the post-war years would you say that is the moment of a very considerable break uh, in some ways uh, from the past or not given what else is going on in Tartarite Britain you know that's such an interesting question and it's it's, it's sort of um, I suppose that it's the kind of question that I'm now turning my attention to because uh, the the this you know this particular story I'm telling is sort of framed, kind of bookended by, um, uh, at the at the at the end by uh, Britain's joining the European Economic Community in '73. So what happens in the 1980s is um, at the level of citizenship and and uh, what that means. Um, uh, for Thatcherite politics is uh, is a very interesting one. I'd I'd like to I'd like to know more about that myself. Um, I, I don't know if uh, if either of you have any thoughts on that or or know any more. I'm, I myself am not not quite sure. But what I what I I imagine that that the story goes on. I'm quite I'm quite sort of confident of that, and that's why I was interested to read. I think I alluded to it earlier that 
uh, Philip Murphy has some new work coming out on this. And I imagine that that there is that that you know there there is something to say on 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 that question. Can I ask you about you sort of in, at various points? You say um, I think it's the nineteen sixty is it sixty seven sixty eight act um, that you you say is the origin of the hostile environment. Is that right? Where they 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 get the Home Secretary gets powers to deport people, uh, certain categories of migrant have to register um, with the police. And um, uh, I, I wanted you, I was uh, to say a little bit more about that. And obviously, I, 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 on the one hand, I think, yes, obviously, but on the other hand, I think, is that just the origin of a state fostered hostile environment in the sense that it wasn't the environment hostile uh, it, but in a non-official way in the 50s and 60s, and it just becomes officially hostile with that act. And I, I wonder if you would engage a little bit more critically with this idea of the hostile environment, who creates it, who's responsible for it, and the role that this immigration legislation has in, in creating that hostile environment. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, I, I, um, it's, it's obviously not a main argument within the book, but I do sort of uh, rather tantalizingly and uh, uh, refer to the 1971 uh, Immigration Act as the ultimate source of the the hostile environment. And you know, the, the 71 Act was uh, really an attempt by Edward Heath's government to regularize uh, modern British immigration policy. Heath had run on a campaign that, that promised a, a kind of, um, uh, uh, that, that his government would would review and bring some kind of coherence to British immigration policy. And, and one of the things that the 71 Act did is that it, uh, it created a category of the, something called the, the patrial. Now patrial is, it's not a, a neologism, it's not a, a new word, it's a, an archaic word. Uh, I think it shares an etymology with patriot. And really what the patriarch was, was somebody who had an, an ancestral connection to Britain. Uh, technically not at the level of blood or race, but at the level of territorial connection. So again, this is a kind of indirect racial discrimination. Um, so you, you have this category that was created um, and part of the, the rules attendant on the act said that it was up to the individual to uh, prove that he or she was a, a patriot. And many, dec in, you know, many decades later, in, um, under more recent policy, this led to the children of Commonwealth migrants not being able to uh, prove their documentation. And it, it's, and it speaks to um, Really, the the very the very I mean the, the the origins of the Windrush scandal, as well as the hostile environment, are a sort of strange mix of immigration law and nationality law. And as I as I sort of said, there's there's some internal tensions between the two, and in, and in and in from those internal sort of contradictions that were that were sort of not really fully resolved until quite late you have the, the conditions that, that led to both um, a kind of uh, an, a particular environment for, for, for immigrants and also for the uh, Windrush scandal. But you know, one of the interesting sort of anecdotes or episodes in the book is the reaction of the veteran Indian diplomat Upper Pont to the, um, to the 71 Act. And he is, um, He's in London and confronts privately the British Home Secretary and, and says, you know, this is um, a particularly sort of punitive piece of legislation. Um, so uh, I think we can, so really it's, I, I would say, I'm, I'm not trying to draw a direct causation, but simply that it sort of lays the, the kind of legal architecture for the kind of policies that would, and scandal that later occurred, uh, particularly the Windrush scandal. And, you know, there's a sense that British officials are always sort of struggling to keep up with the, with the oddities and complexities of their own immigration and 
nationality law, which is famously notoriously Byzantine. Thank you, Taylor. And we now do have a couple of more questions. Uh, so the first one is by Natasha Radu. Uh, please, I apologize for my pronunciation if it's incorrect. Uh, but the, it's, you know, she thanks you for the fascinating talk and promises, very promisingly, so to buy the book and read it for a longer answer to her question. But as she researches citizenship in the French empire, she was, she's a little fixated on your use of the term citizen. And in uh, Natasha's understanding, uh, you know, they were, uh, there was never a sharp distinction in the British Empire between citizen and subject as per the French. Was the term, was this term being used specifically post-1948 in the 1960s and 70s? That is the precise question. Thank you, Natasha, for the, for the question. And, um, you know, these the sort of comparative questions with respect to the French Empire are very, you know, very interesting. And my, my colleague at LSE, Bronwyn Mambi, has, uh, has written on, on some of those comparisons from the sort of legal perspective. Um, and, it's, and it is uh, a particularly confusing question, this relationship that I think persists to this day um, between, you know, the idea of citizen and subject, which is, of course, uh, also the subject of uh, an influential book by Mahmoud Mandani. Um, and of course, there's also the kind of this, uh, what these, also in international law, um, the emphasis tends to be on, um, you know, nationality rather than citizenship. So there's a, the, the question of which term we use is, is quite important, I think. Um, um, and uh, as you might expect, the answer to the question is, is a little, complicated in the sense that I think, as I alluded to earlier, the 1948 Act does not abolish British subjecthood. So it retains the scheme of British subjecthood, but also introduces a parallel scheme of nationality called citizenship of the UK and colonies. Um, so uh, a British, a, a British, sub, British subjecthood is retained. Uh, also, confusingly, the 48 Act introduces something called Commonwealth citizenship, which is a kind of underlying status uh, that combines citizenship of the UK and colonies and Commonwealth citizenship of an independent Commonwealth state. Uh, so there are some sort of complexities here. Now, some scholars would say and, I, and I, would, I would agree that we, we shouldn't really call the citizenship between 1948 and 1981 British citizenship, which is the current legal term, and that only comes into creation in 1981. But what's interesting is that among uh, politicians, British politicians, they did actually, the, com the most commonly used term was simply British citizenship. And this uh, referred to both people born in, you know, um, in somewhere like uh, Leeds, as well as someone born in uh, Nairobi. Um, so uh, with, with that said, um, uh, the most, the, we should, we should, yeah, we should try and distinguish between citizens of the UK and colonies, citizens of an independent Commonwealth country, both of whom are within an overarching category of Commonwealth citizenship, and the and but also within politicians' discourses, you know, British subjects still crops up. Um, and interestingly, after 1967, there's an, another category which is created privately among British officials called UK passport holders under the acronym UKPH which is Britain's British officials way of dealing with the fact that, you know, whether they're British protective persons or full blown British citizens, they, they have passports and that's going to be a problem with respect to uh, their attempt to enter the UK. So I suspect that that question has probably raised more questions than it, than it answered, but, um, uh, but I hope that that was helpful uh, in some sense. Thank you.
Thank you, Ian. There are two more questions. First of it is, does the book or are there any other works uh, that look at the Ugandans and Kenyans that who returned to India, especially I think in the early 70s, if I'm correct, if I'm not wrong. And then there is a question by Sadia Humayu, who is a freelance journalist. And she asks, would you agree that the fate of someone like Shamima Begum has everything to do with the deprivation law of 1948, effectively making it a two-tier citizenship system? Thank you very much for those questions. Um, to answer the first question uh, about which, which I think was specifically about East African South Asians who, who returned to India either in the late 1960s and 1970s, there's no uh, single book on this. Um, and, and, uh, and I think it, it's very much a book that uh, ought to be written. What we do know and what I sort of describe in the book is that there were, um, you know, there were, there were quite a few thousand um, of these East African, South Asian, British citizens who, who did quietly uh, enter India, um, you know, quite a few thousand. Uh, and and uh, Indira Gandhi's government tended not to publicize this because it didn't want to sort of emphasize a kind of capitulation to, um, you know, Britain's attempt to sort of foist its own nationals onto uh, to India. Um, but actually sort of tracking what happened to those communities and then presumably their naturalization as Indian citizens um, and, 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 you know, the, the places they tended to uh, enter, whether it was uh, Gujarat or, or, or Kutch or wherever it might be, that would be uh, fascinating to, to read about. Um, you know, there, 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 there tends to be not too much on the, on the Kenyan episode as a whole, uh, but, but Randall Hansen wrote about it in, in his book uh, a few years ago, and there's new work coming out on uh, the, Ugandan Asia, the Ugandan Asian expulsion more, more broadly, which was, you know, and part of the story of, of my book and, and other work is that when the Ugandans were expelled from the, 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 the South Asian Ugandans were expelled in 1972 by Idi Amin, they were settled across the world. And there was a huge diplomatic effort by British officials to sort of have these people settled in third countries, even though some of them carried British nationality. Um, and some of them went to India, some of them went to Canada and other places. I mean, it's a really a, a vast dispersal and there's, um, there's a new chapter on this but in Becky Taylor's new book, uh, which is just out on uh, refugees in modern post-war Britain. And I believe that uh, Ria Kapoor is working on a new study of the Ugandan Asian expulsion. Uh, the second question about the... Um, sorry, I'll just add, there's a PhD student called Sarah Kozeman, who's working in Belgium on, again, on on the Indian side of the expulsion of Asians from East Africa, looking at how hard India worked in the 70s to keep Indians uh, or people of Indian origin from returning to India. So uh, I would check out her work uh, as, it, as it becomes available. Sorry, go ahead, Ian. Thanks, Taylor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Sarah Kusman wrote a, a, a brilliant article on um, uh, has already published a brilliant article on uh, the Ugandan expulsion and uh, and many of the the files that she refers to I also uh, look at and, and of course as we mentioned earlier Taylor and Rafaela Khan also are looking have new work coming out on India's relationship with overseas Indians in Sri Lanka and Burma um, so there's a huge story to be told here and I think that the, the you know, the, the final transnational history of this story remains to be told, you know, from the perspective of East African governments and as well as South Asian governments. And I, and I only, I, I do touch on that transnational history, but I inevitably overweight the, the British uh, story. Um, oh, don't worry, it's nice to see your, your cat there, Taylor. Um, She's a famous Zoom bomber. She loves the attention, sorry. Oh, well, yeah, I can see. Uh, 
we, yes, she has our attention. Um, and you know, the, the second question uh, is also a really interesting one in the sense, and I, and I don't know much about this, but what I, what I was, I was able to, uh, I, I'm sort of hesitant to, to comment on it because I don't know um, the case properly, but I, I did ascertain that from what I, from, I understand that um, there's an assumption here that, <clears throat> you know, anybody who, has a relationship with a former British colony could somehow, somehow in, in some residual sense could be deemed to belong to it. So there's a sense that, you know, uh, whether a government in question, we, we, the, the, uh, many of us in, in Britain have only one citizenship, but because of um, these histories, there, there could be an argument that we might be deemed to belong to another government. And that I think is implicated in, in the story uh, that I'm telling in the book. Sorry, I think I missed the last bit. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for some, such really detailed uh, responses, Ian, and very important interventions, Taylor. There is one, uh, you know, one compliment, really, not a question by one of the audience members, Dr. Shabana Marshall, who, who's a senior lecturer at St. Mary's University in Twickenham, um, who, had to, who had to leave, unfortunately, but thanks for your fascinating insights. They'll certainly buy the book and thought that this is very useful for informing a discussion around South Asian Heritage Month, which is commencing in mid of July. But I think that's, and of course, there's more thanks coming from those whose questions you have very helpfully responded to and answered. Uh, on that note, could I, could I, you know, just thank you both for this fascinating conversation. It's a very important kind of walk back uh, at a very important moment of history and a particular kind of legislation which kind of, which defined post-war, post-war United Kingdom and, you know, it's various afterlives. I'm very much, as you can see from some of the questions that are asked, uh, both my knowledge and interests are, you know, it becomes, it goes up as we come more closer to time. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to reading both of your work, especially if you're working on the Thatcher Wright period again for your next project. Um, I, but I must say, sorry, there's one question I think before we stop, which was asked, and I'm not sure whether the answer is, is by uh, the journalist Sadi Humayu. Uh, did did we cover that about the impact of Shamima Beg? You know that the fate of someone like Shamima Begum is everything. You know, I'm sorry, I missed my internet got stuck at some point. Did we? We did. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so yes, thank you, and to everyone, thank you for joining this afternoon. And once again, I would you know echo Taylor's point. Please buy this book. It's fascinating. Uh, and yes. One, you know, I look forward to seeing you all in the next session of the South Asia Institute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Avinash. Thanks, Avinash. Bye, Thank everyone. You all. Bye.